that being said, uh, back in the studio here, we have our in-house analyst, the public affairs uh, commentator and uh, a regular on the program, Mr. Defolarin Olamilekon, who will be discussing some of the milestones reached by the current administration alongside some of the shortfalls that many people believe the government has faced especially the People's Democratic Party that has accused the APC-led administration of anti-people policies that is causing a bottleneck in the growth and progress of the country. Hello and good morning, Mr. Adefolari. Good morning, Chidoka, and good morning to all our viewers. It's good to be here once again. And happy anniversary to all Nigerians, 64 years of independence. It's quite a very worthy celebration to do. Certainly, 64 years of independence. Mm. On one hand, a lot of people are excited. <laughs> Nigeria is almost seven decades mm. old. Mm. But on the other hand, people like uh, the former Vice President, Alhaji Atiku Abubakar of the PDP, mm. uh, isn't really excited particularly about this uh, Independence Day anniversary, considering the fact that uh, he has been quite vocal in the news, mm. criticizing the current administration of anti-people policies hmm. the opposite of anti-people's policy is a is a elite pro elite policies that's what it means so if the government of the day is, is carrying out anti-people's policy that means or the other way around is a pro elite policy which means that it is the elite that are benefiting and who is article is a member of the elite so in as much as it's criticizing the government you understand that the policy of the government is favoring its likes who are in government or who have once been in government or who are trying as much as well to be in government, you should understand that. So for me, it's not something new that you'll be saying. It's just for us to understand that when elite are speaking from the side of the divide, trying to punch all the people in government, you should also know that they're also creating opportunity for them to be more popular. And the policy is talking about is a policy that is against the people, but favoring the elite, the floating of the naira. Who is benefiting from it? Who owns the dollar? Who keep dollars as a source of wealth? Is the elite. The, lead, uh, the former vice president belong to who are the people in charge of oil and gas sector in Nigeria? Is the elite who are building filling station here and there, who are buying steak in refineries here and there, who are importing PMS? Who are they? Is the elite? So, in as much as you want to make us understand it's an anti, anti people's policy, you should also know that it is the pro elite policy that's making the rich to be richer and the poor to be poorer. And that's what government policy is all about because the elite that you see today in Nigeria are the instrument. Because the state is the instrument in the hand of the elite to carry out what will benefit them on a general note. And we should all be able to understand that from the angle that is bringing this particular conversation. For me, I will have to dissect that statement that in as much as an anti-people's policy, it's also a pro-elite policy which it belongs to. You can't complain to Nigeria that, that it is suffering from high, high price of food or it's suffering from a high cost of fuel. Because he has the money. Well, 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 don't you think that perhaps this is coming from not really an angle of him suffering, mm -hmm. particularly, mm -hmm. but maybe out of concern for people that he believes are suffering, people at the grassroots who might not be part of the elite as he is, mm -hmm. and who might not be able to afford the basic needs uh, that day-to-day -day needs that Nigerians uh, need. Do you, don't you think? Do you, so? you know why I go that critical? Because it was in government 16 years ago, and their government now the owns and the power to build refineries for Nigeria. You get it? Yes. And they missed out. It is the problem created initially, after independence, that the military took over, that the military of themselves failed to repair, that they hand over to civilian in 1999, and the civilian also failed fully to repair, rather than they create more problems. It is that same problem that brings us to where we are today. And the current government also is finding it very difficult to solve the problem. So who are we going to blame? You know, one thing about people like us is that in as much as we want to look at issues from a very critical angle, yes. we must paint it the way it is. It is the problem of the, the problem of the elite. It is the created by the elite. It is the action and inaction of the elite that created the problem. The floating of the Naira, the cost of high food we have suffering from insecurity is as a result of them not taking drastic action. Sixteen years ago when they were in PDP, when they were ruling under Obama as vice president, what did they do about the oil and gas sector in Nigeria? They gave license to people to be importing fuel. The issue of uh, fuel sources that we are suffering today is as a result that they fail to take action. Rather, they concentrate on areas that will make the elite to be more richer and they continue to dish out palliative. It was under their government that Nigerians know about cash conditional cash transfer that they begin to give Nigerians money. Nobody was giving Nigerians money in the in, in years past. But all this came as a result of 
they don't understand the solution to the problem they have found themselves. And the problem keeps going and it keeps increasing. Well, well, well Mr. Olamalekon, let me just uh, get your take, mm. particularly uh, this morning. Mm. The atmosphere is tense. Mm. There are military vehicles stationed all around the, the city. Mm. At the Eagle Square mm. Islands, uh, as we saw in the news, exactly. that there are about 10 armored vehicles mm -hmm. stationed there against the planned anti-government protest, mm. October 1st anti-government protest. Mm. It appears as if this isn't really a celebration of an anniversary, mm. but rather it's met by a lot of apprehension. Exactly. People are scared mm. rather than celebrating. Mm. Well, how did we get to this point where what used to be an exciting thing for Nigerians mm. has now become... A very scary thing. It goes back to the failure of the elite to ensure that Nigerians enjoy their country, benefit from the resources that government has given to us, and distribute these resources equally and affordably and accessibly to Nigerians. Rather, you can see the caricature uh, pictures on uh, on the Guardian newspaper. Yes. You have a big elite having a big pot and with then a big still, spoon, still, still dragging, still dragging small a small one. pot, yeah. or a small plate of a food that is going to the masses. That's what is happening. Because over the years, the, uh, the elite have failed to distribute the resources of the country equally accessible to all Nigerians. So they already only just accumulate and accumulate as a means of primitive accumulation to themselves. And that's what is causing this, whatever protests that Nigerians want to have at this today, or whatever protests that are going to take place anyway. But also, the, the essence of the security tight is because of the failure of the last protest. We all knew how that protest turned out. I was also part of people who are out in media houses talking. By the time we are trying to go back home in the evening, it was something else we met. People who claim to be protesters, talk to people who are snatching bags, snatching phone, collecting people's money and the rest of them. So security have to be tight. But on the other hand, we must understand why we are where we are today. Because of the failure of the elite to ensure that resources of the state, resources of Nigerian is equally distributed. And rather, it is a political accumulation whereby the Guardian newspaper have showed us the picture of what is happening. The elite take over everything and give us the small one. Even the small one they are giving us, they still want to collect it from us. Now, now, now I, I just want you to react to something. The, the depiction of the milestones mm. reached by the Renewed Hope Agenda. Mm. Now, I would have uh, that on the screen mm. uh, in a short while. While we dissect one, the new minimum wage, mm. issues of uh, insecurity, exactly. uh, capital projects, projects in, in, uh, mm. constituency projects across mm. the country, the CNG initiative, mm -hmm. which has been a very big topic mm. uh, in the country, the student loan uh, mm. fund, uh, which uh, about 46,000 students have uh, you know, accessed. Exactly. Now, now, this is on the leadership newspaper. Mm. It will greet your screen now as uh, we dissect these issues mm. Uh, one after the other. Firstly, the issue of the 70,000 Naira new minimum wage, uh, the federal government has said that it has commenced full implementation exactly. of the minimum wage. Mm. And then on security, 33,700 terrorists have been killed in the last six months. Mm. And Nigeria's most feared bandit leaders are being systematically neutralized mm. now of the latter statement mm. i know that one or two bandit leaders have been neutralized in the last couple of uh, months mm -hmm. however the person that seems to be a key factor in the terrorism or banditry in the northwestern part of the country bello turji mm. is still at large mm. and it appears as if he's eluding the entire armed forces of the country exactly is he is he is, he, is he still at large or is he a ghost or is he money or is, is changing into different faces or the, uh, the 2G Bale or whatever it is being Bello called. Bale 2G. Is it that it's a different caricature of different people that we are just hearing? Just like when we were hearing the former broker around leader, then, uh, if I could remember his Abubakar name. Shekau. Abubakar Abubakar Shekau. Before you know it, Abubakar Shekau has been killed. Abubakar Shekau has been arrested. Abubakar Shekau is operating here and there. Maybe that's the same nomenclature, I mean, the same process that the current two, uh, Bale 2G has also taken over. But one thing I don't understand is that over the years, the military have tried so much in the northeast and the northwest to eliminate or to neutralize bandits. But work still needs to be done. Community are still suffering. Just two weeks ago, a set of bandits blocked the highway on Zamfara State. And the whole uh, travelers hostage for a very long hour. And I think about seven security men were killed. Four soldiers and three policemen were killed. Although they were able to break through that, that road and uh, dislodge the, the bandit. But 
with lots of gallant uh, soldiers and, and policemen. Which never should have happened in the first exactly. place. So what I'm trying to point out, in as much as the government is celebrating the achievement in the security sector, more still need to be done. More work still need to be done. The 33,000 bandits that have been killed, neutralized, is just a minute in the entire architecture of the numbers of bandits that we have been hearing. They may not even be up to that level, but we know that things have been done in that regard. But what I'm trying to point out, the government must take the security architecture very, very seriously. Particularly, their war against bandits and terrorism must be taken very seriously because the northeast and the northwest is suffering this uh, effect of this uh, bad security or insecurity they are having. Then again, the north center is also suffering it. National war, Benue, is also having issues of insecurity, which the government must also take very seriously. I'm not talking about ritual killing, I'm not in the southwest, and other kidnapping and killing activities of criminals across the country because security is not just in the North East or in the North West, it's across the country. So the government will take that very, very serious. Although they, they put the significance or importance of terrorism issues as the number one uh, factor they are trying to address. But other issues of security are taking place, which the government will take very, very serious at this point in time. Now, now, now on the issue of uh, capital projects that uh, the, this administration mm -hmm. has embarked on, and uh, executed it says here that of 330 bridges and mm. roads are marked for repairs in mm. 2023 mm. over 85 percent now completed mm. lagos calabar and sokoto but Dagri highway projects ongoing mm. while east west road being redesigned exactly exactly these are all major infrastructures mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. most people or mo major roads that most people ply you know to get around the country and exactly. all and if there is one that we can all attest to it's perhaps the fct's major roads that mm -hmm. are being you know completed mm -hmm. abandoned projects that are being completed or have been completed mm -hmm. in the last one year mm -hmm. how much uh, impact does this particular statement in terms of about 330 uh, projects being rehabilitated. Mm. How much of an impact do you think this would have uh, on the common man? Considering the fact that it certainly does not put food on the table of uh, the masses who are hungry. Actually, there are two things we can gain from road construction, road rehabilitation that the government is carrying out. One is that it's a movement of people will be easy. Then contracts will be given out, which will create a kind of a seasonal job yes. for people around that area that we're working for the construction company. Or, or carrying out those road projects. But putting food on the, on the tables of individual and group means that they have to move out of their environment, they have to have access to good road. That's what it means. But what Nigerians are really calling for, in as much as these projects are also ongoing, uh, some of them are completed, there is much road to be constructed. There is much road to be reformed, to be rehabilitated, re no, redesigned as expected. The popular Kefi Abuja road has been in a dilapidated shape for over two years. Last week, me and uh, B2 talked seriously about that road. How FEMA has abandoned that road. That road is almost cutting off. And it's a major road. It's a major road coming from the north central yes. into FCT. Yes. The same thing with Abuja Lokoja Road. There are also areas that need to be fixed. When we counted sections Abuja of Kaduna Road Abuja, as well. Abuja Kaduna Road is still ongoing. I think they are, they are enjoying the capital investment from the federal government. But I'm talking about the one that government have removed its hand completely. The Abuja Kefi Road is need to be repaired. The Abuja local Road also needs some sections to be repaired. The Abuja Kefi Road, there are about 82 sections that need to be repaired, yeah. fixed, because of erosion have damaged some of the road shoulders and the rest of them. So, upon that, that the government is celebrating its road infrastructure uh, 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 achievement, more roads need to be constructed. According to the Minister of Works, there are over 72,000 road infrastructure that government need to fix. They are just looking at 33 now. There are others ones that have not yet to be touched. There's a popular road in between Calabar and Aquaribon State that have been in the leadership for over many years. They need to look at that road. We congratulate them. They have been able to fix the Portaco Enugu Road very clean. They also be able to fix the Lafia, Lafia Makodi Road very good. But there are other roads that need to be fixed. Apart from the North Central and North East and North West, South East also needs some road to be fixed. South West also needs some roads to be fixed. Not the popular Abuja, I mean, Lagos Ibadan. Uh, expressway. Those ones are very popular. The other road, like the Goshagamu road, it also need to be fixed. The Akurei Ibadan road need to be fixed. So we need to call out the government that some of these roads need to be you know, concretely fixed so that we can enjoy accessible road in Nigeria. And, and, and some people might criticize the government and say that instead of you know coming up with new capital projects mm. to execute 
as most administrations do, mm. abandoning projects embarked on by previous administrations. Mm. Perhaps this is a move in the right direction, ensuring that these roads are rehabilitated mm. and not just coming up with new projects uh, as a means of siphoning money, exactly. as many people would, uh, would uh, argue. Definitely. That's what the Mikoni Minister of Works uh, engineer Umani, uh, Umani. David Mai was trying to yes. put across that for him they are not after a new project they are looking at how to uh, finish up the old project which they are carrying that's why they talk about the 33,000 old road they are fixing yes. which is very important but what I'm trying to point out in as much as they are fixing those old roads there are still other old roads that are much more important to the people that's why I mentioned the Abuja Abuja Kefi Expressway which is very key to people coming from North Central into Abuja then Lagos I mean Abuja uh, local Jarod, which is also very, very key. They will have not, we should not forget the Bida Mina Express, which is also very, very important for the government to fix. So, in as much as they're celebrating all these road fixing, which will also create accessible road, good road for Nigerian supply, the key issue is that the maintenance of those roads is also very important. We should not forget the issue of maintenance of those after constructing them. Don't leave it fallow. Allow FEMA to be able to take care of the maintenance of the road as well as their community owns some of those roads. Because when community doesn't own those roads, it becomes a challenge. That's why I see before one, two years, those, those roads begin to fill. And before you know it, there will be a challenge that the government will not be calling for more budgetary allocation for such roads to be fixed or to be repaired. We must be able to encourage government to continue to maintain roads and ensure that those roads are fixed in a way that Nigerians can have a stable good road for a long time. All right, uh, Mr. Olamilekon. Uh, you have rightly made a point there, ensuring that not roads are only built but maintained as well. Rehabilitation of these roads and ensuring that the safety of people plying the roads are intact is also another key issue that Mr. Olamilekon here has highlighted. Now, as Nigeria celebrates her 64th Independence Day anniversary, pressure is being mounted on the government as citizens have protested twice in two months. This story is captured on the front pages of about four national dailies this morning. The Nigerian News Direct, The Daily Sun, The Vanguard Newspaper, and The Standard Times. On that being said, let's uh, pick up the first two and have a brief overview of the headline stories. And we'll be back to the discussion. On the front page of the Nigerian News Direct, you'd find the headline story inserted there. Nigeria at 64. Pressure mounts on Independence Day as Nigerians protest hardship twice in two months. Straplines say... We will not be deterred. Shawaray vows as police deploy personnel. No procession, rally will be allowed in Abuja, AIG. Atiku wants of democratic erosion, says Nigeria's progress threatened by lack of political inclusivity. While Nigeria still a crawling giant at 64, CUPP says. Above the masthead. Federal government approves 122 billion naira investment in six indigenous firms for gas infrastructure development. While Axis Bank relaunches W initiative to drive financial inclusion and empowerment in Zambia and Botswana. Tinubu swears in Chief Justice of Nigeria reiterates commitment to independence of judiciary. While Ayeda Tiwa grants pardon to 117 convicts. Now these, I believe is in line with the commemoration of Nigeria's 64th uh, Independence Day anniversary. You'd find inserted on the front page of the Nigerian News Direct a picture of President Bola Ahmed Tinubu congratulating the Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Kudirat Kekere Ekun, after her swearing in ceremony as CJN as the presidential villa in Abuja yesterday. And right next to that is uh, a picture of the Governor of Lagos State, Mr. Babajide Sanwolu, received in audience or receiving in audience the board of directors of Odua Investment Company Limited led by the group chairman Otumba Bimbo Ashiru at Lagos House Ikeja recently. Moving away from the Nigerian News Direct uh, onto the Daily Sun newspaper on the front page of the Daily Sun you'd find uh, the headline story Nigeria at 64 tales of frustration despair distress the older you get, the more frustrated you become, senior citizens have revealed. While feature stories inserted beside the masthead, 
Nigeria on brink of one-party dictatorship, Atiku warns. Hold federal government responsible for another strike, Asu says. Bauchi governor writes Tinubu demands investigation of intended pilgrim arrested for alleged banditry. We are winning war on terror and banditry, President Bola Amatinubu has said. Hmm. Well, quite a very conflicting <laughs> statement exactly. there in the news, uh, De mm -hmm. Firstly, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, as a means of celebrating mm. uh, a 64th year anniversary, it mm. should be uh, the the newspaper headlines should come with some sort of light mm. and hope for Nigerians. Mm. But it appears as if, just as it, the caption here says, mm. it's just a tale of frustration, mm -hmm. despair, mm. and distress. Mm. On one hand, Atiku is warning Nigerians that uh, Nigeria is at the brink of a one-party dictatorship, and on the other hand, uh, President Bola Metinubu is lauding himself and his administration saying they have been doing well in the last one year. And let's take the one of what the president was saying they have been doing well in one year. Technically, yes, the economy is growing. But in the reform of it, the economy is in distress. People are frustrated. People are in depression. People are lacking. People are crying out. People are frustrated. But on the technical side, the technical side of the economy is to look at it from the angle of what the figures are saying, what the numbers are saying. Yes. Growth figure 34, 23, 2.6. Those, those are the figures that government will be seen. That's what the president will be shown to. And that's what will be seen. So you will see growth. But when you come to the field, you see something different. You see high cost of living. You see high cost of uh, transportation. You see high cost of rent. You see high you see, even see the minimum, minimum way they pass, not able to settle or take care of the needs of the people. Yes. You get it? So a lot of frustration is out there. Because the economy, as we speak right now, is not affecting the people as expected. Below the ladder of classes in Nigeria, from the lower middle class downward, they are suffering. From the elite to the upper middle class, they are comfortable. We will have to say that because there are six classifications of Nigerian uh, classes. The elite, and the elite can be divided into like three groups. The political elite, the economic elite, as well as the Means of the owners of economic uh, owners of means of production edit. Then the upper class are people like already stable, owners of small small businesses. You have already participated in government before. Then the lower class are people who are working for professionals. Then the other class, which is the fourth range, are people that maybe civil servants, a little bit of senior class, civil servant. Then lower of it are the people who are struggling, small small business owner. Then the lower part of the bottom are the people with nothing, unemployed people. Frustrated people across the country. That's the six layers of classes in Nigeria. But the two upper class are enjoying the elite and the upper class. But the rest four are struggling because they depend on the other two to survive. M many people would argue that as it stands right now, Nigeria doesn't even have a middle class. It's just the lower and the upper class. The mm. middle class is almost fizzling out because with the economic hardship mm -hmm. currently bedeviling both the lower and the middle class, it's quite difficult to differentiate between who is uh, low and who is medium. Because that's why I, I, I say upper middle class and the lower middle class. The upper middle class are the ones that have joined the elite, one way or the other. Majority of the people that you see that are in government are upper middle class. They are not the elite yet. Until they cross over to the elite rank, elite group, who will now become the ruling and the governing elite, who dictate to the state what the state will do. Because we understand that aspect of how to understand the state of Nigeria. Yes. Because the elite as you see, are the ones that control the state because the state is an instrument in the elite, in the hand of the elite. You get it? Like the elite control the police, the military, the soldiers, the, everything that you see, the prison, the court, the control. They appoint yes. the judges, they appoint this and that. And set of the judges, and the, they are in the upper class. They are not in the middle class. So that's why you can understand the classes in Nigeria. But what they are trying to point out is that the frustration out there will not make any newspaper to bring any, I mean, I mean um, any celebrated team as a newspaper headline. Yes. If any newspaper want to sell today, if any media want to sell market today, they will not bring any celebrating team as their title or as their frame or else nobody will want to read that newspaper. But a newspaper that will bring and show the pictures of how Nigerians are suffering at this point in time and just like what Guidance newspaper did by doing a caricature picture, a cartoon of the elite with the big tummy, with the big pot and big spoon and the masses with a small pot, with a small spoon and the elite still want to collect that plate of food from the masses. That is how Nigeria is today. 
That's why you see that uh, Daily Sun talk about despair, talk about depression, talk about frustration because that's what is and happening. Distress. And distress. Yes. And the president also pointed that I address this money, then you understand the feelings of Nigeria. You know that there is hardship. But how much of that hardship that does he know? That's why we depend. And how much more patient can Nigerians be? Nigerians don't even have the patience. Nigerians don't have the patience. That's why everybody using the word resilience. Because there is no patience anymore. And, and, and now in, in, in less than two months, mm. Nigerians have protested mm. against the government mm. twice. Mm. As we uh, will see here on the Vanguard newspaper, let's uh, just quickly run through the next two papers exactly. and I'll come back to you mm. to have your take on this. Now on the front page of the Vanguard newspaper, as it greets your screen right now, you'd find uh, inserted beneath the masthead, protest, police talk tough. Organizers allege intimidation. Straplines say nobody is harassing organizers, federal government, IGP, others watertight security nationwide. AIG Igwe warns against protest, says miscreants, Shiites want to hijack, hijack protests. We won't allow protest or procession in Abuja, FCT command has said. Now, on the front page of the Standard Times, you'd find there, Independence Day, IGP orders watertight security as Tinubu addresses the nation. Hmm. We are faced by yet hmm. another hmm. Uh, protest hmm. caused by the anger and frustration in Nigerians hmm. due to the continuous daunting economic hardship hmm. that is bedeviling the country. Exactly. Yet it appears that each time a protest wants to hold the federal government alongside uh, the police tend to kick really hard against it i mean it begs the question is protest now illegal in the country when you say the federal government well, let us quickly correct this it is not the federal it is the elite who doesn't want violence or call so that there will not be a change in power or there will be a challenge to their power it is the elite it's not federal government, federal government who, who control the government is the elite the elite are afraid of violence the elite are afraid of Things that will cause commotion that will make them to lose grip of the power because the masses are ready to take over the power so the elite must do everything to ensure that the, that power doesn't get to the masses so when you say federal government invariably we are talking about the elite because it's the elite that control the government they control the court they control the police they control everybody that is the factors or the, the command of the elite what we call the commanding height of the state yes. so that is what is happening so for the protest the reason why this may also occur particularly for the poor people who are not who are not even interested in the protest, but who just want to end their living. Why government have to tighten up security? It's because the organizers of the protest sometimes can lose faith or lose hold of the protest organization. Like the one that happened in the, uh, uh, earlier in August. Yes. Because they lost control of the, of the protest. They now allow so miscreant to hijack the protest. And instead of people protesting, burning uh, uh, tires on the highway, blocking traffic, stopping people collecting their bags, collecting their money, that's not part of protest. So we must also guide against... That's such. a riot. It's not even a riot. It's just act of criminality by a set of people who doesn't even understand the essence of why people are protesting. Because the protesters are already educated Nigerians on the essence of their protest. Like what happened the last time. We interrogated some people that are saying they are doing... And I said, what are they... What, please mention to me one or three things why they are doing protests. Everybody, they just kept quiet. They are just speaking language that some of us doesn't even understand. And we say, is that a protest? That's not a protest. You don't even understand the essence of this protest. You are that blocking... Room. So... The organizers have educated Nigerians on the protest. But the problem they may have with security is because of the hijack of the protest by certain miscreants who also melted arms against some of the protesters. In Yanya, for instance, people came out to protest, their phones were collected. You get it? So we must also guide against that. But in the long run, what we are trying to point out in this discussion is that we know that the elite will not be happy if there is rioting, if there is chaos. In Nigerian society. Well, well Adefola, in talking about the elites, earlier you mentioned uh, that Atiku Abubakar, Elijah Atiku Abubakar, is part of the elite and is certainly not facing the hardship hmm. that most Nigerian masses are facing. Exactly. So he shouldn't really be criticizing the government in that manner. Hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. like I mentioned, he has been quite vocal. Mm -hmm. And we saw a statement uh, on the front page of the Daily Times, the mm -hmm. Daily Independent, mm -hmm. as well as the Metrics, where the NLC, the People's Democratic Party, mm -hmm. and Elijah Atiku Abubakar are all bemoaning the state of the polity in the country. Mm -hmm. What would you say? Well, well, but before I have you react to that, mm. let's just pick one paper uh, out of these three and mm -hmm. have 
just take a look at exactly. what these statements are saying now mm. uh, as it greets your screen the daily times newspaper uh, captured on the front page of the daily times uh, you'd find nigeria at 64 nlc pdp atiku bemoan state of polity this is on the front page of the daily times now the strap lines there read nigerians must continue to demand accountability from their leaders nlc has revealed mm -hmm. Resist APC's total, uh, totalitarianism, mm. exploitation, PDP tells Nigerians. At 64, Nigeria lacks political inclusivity, free, fair elections, says Atiku. Mm. Three statements mm -hmm. coming in from NLC, mm -hmm. PDP, and Atiku. If, if, if you take the word of the NLC, you take yes. it very, very, very um, um, Correct in his own way, in the sense that accountability from all Nigerian leaders yes. goes back to 20, 1999, goes back to 1960, because it's because, because of lack of accountability that we have found ourselves in the problem that we have found ourselves. Now, for the other two people that make it, they are making statements from the political sentiment they belong. That is how people belong to a political party when they want to make statements, want to draw emotional sympathy or empathy from Nigerians to themselves. That's what they do. But take the one of NLC, accountability. And that falls on PDP, that falls on article. Then on the issue of uh, ensuring that we have accountability goes back to what the elite are doing in Nigerian society. What the elite are doing. Either a dominant class elite, a ruling class elite, or a governing elite. Because I also need to also bring out the clarification of this elite. We have dominant class elite, ruling class elite, and governing class elite. As we speak right now, all the people serving in government are the governing class elite. All the people who have served before or currently serving are members of the dominant class elite. Then we also have people who belong to the elite who are called the ruling class elite. Because at any point in time, either there's election or there's no election, this set of elite always makes decisions that affect the Nigerian people. Yes. They are always available. And in life of article, and members of the PDP, I I level they are all belong to the ruling class and governing class. So we must not separate. So when they are making statements, we should be able to look at it, that statement critically. Is it statement made for in ordinary Nigeria or made to just uh, uh, energize their popularity or ensure that people will continue to remember them as somebody that could be remembered when the election comes. That's the way I'm looking at those statements. Because I know that these people have been in government before. They have been part of the governing elite. They have been part of the dominant elite. They have been part of the ruling elite before. So whatever statement they want to make to encourage Nigerians, we should also remember that and reflect on that statement that in the past we are there. What did you do about our problem? That is the whole way we should be asking our lead. So when NFC is talking accountability, it falls back to what I just said. What do you do when you are in government? When we are having four refineries that your plan in government was to sell those refineries and never to build anyone. Your plan to give people license to build refineries was for the people to be bringing import of oil. And that's what that made the oil and gas sector to be so poor that Nigerian state cannot even take action against people who are in the oil and gas sector because they have now become a cartel. In that sector, even though divided by by political lines, lines and they, 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 are, they, are, they, are, they are they are united, united when it comes to to the, to the resources. Yes, and that's what it means. So if even if a tomorrow article become president of Nigeria, and he find the problem in Nigeria to be something that need to solve, and he carried out some policy, do you think Niger every Nigerian will still be okay I, I, I with mean, for, for someone like uh, former Vice President Atiku mm. Abubakar to be making such statements mm. uh, after being in the corridors of power mm. for the a uh, number of years he mm. served as uh, vice president. Mm. And if you remember, the People's Democratic Party has been at the helm of affairs or had been at the helm of affairs exactly. in the country for about uh, 16 years or so mm. since the inception of democracy. Exactly. Don't you think that the uh, bottlenecks mm. or the allegations that they are throwing at the APC is what many people believe they started during the first uh, couple of years when, when they were in power in the country. Exactly. Even this allegation of a uh, one-party state. Who started one-party state? Who said he's going to rule Nigeria for 60 years before another party will come? It is PDP. So all the late, and you could also remember this is someone that also have also crossed into APC before. He was the founding members of APC. He left because his aspiration and interest was not meant. Yes. And you also know that 2027 is, uh, is by the corner. It's also interesting in the election twenty twenty. So it must begin to throw out statements that will draw sympathy, draw attention, draw emotion, draw people to yourself. That's what he's just doing. He's just doing the normal opposition party politiki that you make statements to arouse sentiment, to to energize people to look at you. Okay, you could be the next 
a person to fix our problem. Meanwhile, you are part and parcel of the challenge right from the beginning. You are a member of the dominant class, you are a member of the ruling class, you are a member of the governing class. So what are we talking about? So what I'm trying to point out is Nigerians should be very, very sensitive when it comes to when elites are making statements. In the sense that some of those statements are not for the interest of the people, it's just for their own personal interest to be aggrandized and increased and made popular. You get it? You can hear what they are talking about, democracy. We ask them, who, who, who started all this manipulation of election in Nigeria? It is this, this elite. When the election comes, uh, I mean, this, this was popularized during the, the regime of uh, successive regimes of uh, PDP exactly. presidents. So it is something that they started and others are continued. And ask me, who are those others in it? It is the members of PDP that form APC. Is it not APC, uh, uh, ACN, ACN. Uh, PDP, uh, uh, APGA, and the rest of them that form uh, PDP, APC? So, so, so it is these the people. So it's just like changing from changing your clothes. It, it, you was, just, it, was, in the it money. was just a merger, a exactly. merger of, of, of persons from different uh, political, political parties. parties. And ask why did they leave APC? Because they didn't align to win the presidential ticket in 2019. He, did, he left and he's now in PDP. And you still want to continue in 2020. So he must always make those statements that would definitely want to make him to be popular, allow people to see him as someone that you need to be respected and the rest of it. But what I'm trying to point out, in as much as he's a political figure in Nigeria, we must, the citizen must understand how to dissect elite statements. Whether that statement is meant for them, for their own interest, or it's just meant for that individual interest. Well, well, let's uh, take a look at uh, you know NLC's statement. Mm. Uh, you earlier mentioned accountability from their leaders and all. How much is NLC doing to mm. ensure that they hold leaders accountable? Mm. Kudos to them. Nigeria now has a new minimum wage, exactly. seventy thousand naira minimum mm -hmm. wage, but. Is that all there is about the NLC? And is that all there is to the NLC? <laughs> NLC we don't have that power to be able to do all that. You know, it does call on citizens to ask because they can't do it. Because even then too, they have problem of accountability and transparency because of the politics of labor unions, because of the politics of trade unions. They also have their own challenges. But in terms of what they are doing, in terms of calling government to action, calling government to order, they have been fairly doing a little bit, not as expected as most of us expect them to do, but they are doing their bit. We just want them to do more. Although because of the dragging, the political dragging within the trade union itself will not allow NLC to be at the forefront of struggle for Nigeria as we expect. Because we do because they also have their own challenges. You get it. They have their internal struggle within themselves, members, union leaders, and the rest of struggling to take one or two things, but to also come at the forefront and bring out that transparency and accountability to call on government. That's why they say citizens should call on government. Because they know that then they say they are not saints. They also have their own challenges, but they are doing their fair bidding in ensuring that accountability is brought on the table in Nigeria. Well, let's uh, let let's look at some more papers uh, making uh, rounds in the news this morning. As we continue on the discussion, uh, we'll be taking a look at uh, the Daily Times again, the Daily Independent, as well as the Matrix newspaper uh, to get more insight into stories making rounds in the news. Now, on the front page of the Daily Times Independent, uh, the Daily Times, uh, just as I had read out earlier, Nigeria at 64, NLC, PDP, Atiku, Bimon, State of Polity. Nigerians must continue to demand accountability from their leaders. Uh, NLC has made a statement, while uh, PDP tells Nigerians to resist APC's uh, totalitarianism and exploitation. And Nigeria at 64, Nigeria's, uh, Nigeria lacks political inclusivity. Free, fair election, says former Vice President Alhaji Atiku Abubakar. Above the mass said you'd find a statement by the Chief of Defense Staff, General Christopher Musa. Protecting Nigeria's solid mineral resources requires collaborative approach. And uh, inserted prominently there on the front page of the Daily Times newspaper is a picture of uh, some victims with their portion of relief materials provided by the Brno State Governor, Professor Babagana Zulum, as a result of recent flood in Maiduguri held at Babagana Wakilhaya Islamic School on Monday. Beneath that inserted picture, you'd find a writer story, Tinubu swears in Justice Kekurekun as CJN, pledges to preserve sanctity of judiciary and other rider stories 64th independence igp others watertight security nationwide uba achieves 40 percent earnings growth to 1.37 trillion naira 
declares 2.00 Naira interim dividend. Troops eliminate 8 terrorists, rescue 40 hostages, says the Nigeria Army. And Middle Belt's minorities demand succession from North and others. <laughs> That's serious. Now, uh, these are the stories on the Daily Times. Uh, let's move away from the Daily Times and join uh, the Daily Independent on this particular lineup. On the front page of the Daily Independent newspaper, you'd find the headline story. Nigeria at 64. Revive nationalism in defense of democracy, PDP tells citizens. And Nigeria is on the brink of one-party dictatorship, Atiku says. Despite challenges, be hopeful, Jonathan urges Nigerians. And above the masthead, CGN Kekere Ekun warns against disobedience to court orders. First half 2024, UBA earnings up 40% to 1.37 trillion naira, declares 2 naira divid interim dividend. Feature stories you'd find on the front page of the Daily Independent, October 1st protest, uh, dialogue with protest leaders, CSOs, charge governments, urge security agents to desist from use of force. Learn to protest within limits of law, NLC president tells members. Rivers to get new people on structure, October 5th, says Fubara. Tinubu reaffirms commitment to uphold judiciary's independence and in the Rivers local government polls. Court bars INEC from releasing voters' registration to RSIEC. Picture of prominence you'd find on this paper is that of President Bola Ametinubu congratulating uh, Justice Kudura Kekere Ekun, the new Chief Justice of Nigeria, during her swearing in ceremony at the pres presidential villa in Abuja on Monday. Now, rather on the Daily Independent. Poor policies slowed aviation sector growth in 64 years, um, a statement by some experts in the industry. And Omokri calls for peace once petrol subsidy will bankrupt Nigeria. Moving away from the Daily Independent, let's uh, pick up our next paper of this lineup, the Matrix newspaper as it greets your screen. On the front page of the Matrix newspaper, you'd find the headline story. Amid hardship, Nigeria celebrates 64th independence. It's followed by strap lines that read, Symbol of national pride, unity, now passes with faint enthusiasm, says the CUPP. Nigerians burdened by broken promises, exploitation and corruption. But don't give up. NLC has made a statement. While IGP assures on watertight security for Nigerians amid protest scare, Shore says no backing down on protest until demands are met. We must tackle challenges undermining our prosperity, downplay issues dividing us, Senate leader uh, Senator Gotsu Lekwabio has uh, revealed. While PDP Atiku lament urges Tinubu to listen to heartbeat of Nigerians. Away from these trap lines, uh, beneath the masthead, you'd find three stories of interest, but prominently is a doubt of the recent swearing in of a new CGN, uh, Kekere Kun, and it starts off with the caption Huge tasks before Kekere Kun are CGN unveiled. Vows to prioritize obedience of court orders. Tinubu pledges commitment to independent judiciary. While court bars INEC from releasing voters' register for Rivers' local government election, Atiku urges National Assembly to consider six year presidential term. Now, these are the stories you'd find on the front page of the Matrix newspaper. Coming back to the studio to you now, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Nefolarin, they are quite uh, interesting stories in the exactly, news. Exactly. Firstly, congratulations to. Uh, Chief Justice uh, Kudirat uh, Kekere Kun exactly. uh, on her swearing in, mm. and she made a really strong statement there that uh, those disobeying court orders mm. will be severely punished. Exactly. Now, this is uh, coming at a time or in a country where a lot of people do really disobey court orders, mm. including 
security agencies. De definitely. And, I, that, I, and, and I know you, you understand what I mean. Very well. And I'm even happy that she's making that for me. But we also need to also encourage the bench, yes. that means the court, to stop giving, uh, uh, giving out uh, misleading and misconcepting judgment. You get it? Yes. Two courts will give different judgment on different issues. I court are most uh, 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 guilty of this. You get it? So we must, we must also, she must also tackle that aspect. Apart from people disobeying court order, she must also talk to the bench, which is the court and the judges that they should stop giving conflicting judgment on the same issues. We have had issues around this particular, uh, particular uh, matter on a several occasions. Don't be surprised that what we are discussing about uh, INEC, court asking INEC not to release voter registration to uh, River State INEC independent yes. organization. You see another court to order INEC to give so them this. So those are conflicting judgment that the bench must also address, which the CGM must talk to the judges that they should please and please, apart from we punishing people who disobey court order, the judges themselves must stop giving conflicting judgment or allowing what they call ex party order to be misrepresented and mis, I mean, mis, I mean mis giving mis out in a way that yeah. is not expected. For instance, we understand uh, ex party order to be that when they give you ex party order, you should come to court and explain. It is not an enforced judgment yet. But we have discovered that people take advantage of the ignorance of that particular uh, part of the law and begin to unleash on the people. So you, she must also address that area. Ex party order abuse, uh, disobedience to court order, and conflicting judgment by judges. They must stop it. If they can help us with these three areas, you discover that the, the, the court and the judiciary will be respected the more as expected. Now, now, there's another statement here that uh, President Tinubu has reaffirmed his commitment to uphold judiciary's independence. Uh, coming from the president, mm. it's it's quite a breath of fresh air, considering the fact that a lot mm. of people have accused the judiciary countless times of being in the pockets of the executive, mm -hmm. of the ruling class. Exactly. I mean, they bring them into power. Definitely. So, and you know what they say, mm. the piper dictates the tune. The, the tune. Definitely. So, so I is this some sort of relief for the judiciary and also for people seeking justice at the hands of uh, the judiciary, the statement by the president? We can, you can, we can interpret that statement in different angles. Independent of the judiciary could mean financial independent for them. They will get what they want financially. Independent of the judiciary could mean that they can dictate on any case that doesn't have to do with the elite. But any case that has to do with the poor, go and make any pronouncement on it. But when it comes to the elite, they, they may not be independent. Then yes. they could be also be independent on the aspect of case and choice that case filing, as well as appointing judges to a particular case. They could yes. be independent for that. But where Nigerians have issue with the judicial independence is the appointment of judges. Because as far as most Nigerians are concerned, there's no independent in appointing judges. Either a, a magistrate court judge or a, or, a, or a municipal court judge, there is no independent of judiciary in that aspect. So that's why many Nigerians have an issue. But financial independent, they can have it. The kind of cases they can decide on the poor people, you can have it. When it comes to the one that affects the elite, definitely they will not be independent. Yes. When it comes to the appointment of judges, definitely they will not be independent. And that's the area that Nigerians are caring for that. We want independence of judiciary, particularly in the appointment. Because what we see is that it is just selection and picking of people, especially among the elite. The range of judges that you see in Nigeria today are from the offspring of the elite in Nigeria. Former governor, former commissioner, son, former this daughter, former wife of this, former that. Those are the people that have been promoted into the judiciary. It, it, it's basically the same circle where you have perhaps mm -hmm. friends or family members, one in politics, mm -hmm. the other in the judiciary. judiciary. That's how, or the one controlling the oil and gas sector, one controlling the hospital, hospital sector, one controlling the military, or one controlling the police. That is how it is being done. And it's not just the Nigerians, it's across. The elite control the spectacle of the state. And what are those spectacles of the state? The courts, the security, the military, the, the, the prisons, as well as the economy. That's how the elite can do it. So, and when they are doing that, they don't just go and pick ordinary person. As I'm sitting there, nobody come and pick me to become a DG or anything. Because I'm not a member of a political party. I don't have a godfather. I'm not, a mem I'm, I'm not from any elite family. So, they will always bring their offspring in, into this. Except I fight. And how do I fight? I fight by maybe struggle with them, enter their political party, make all the noise. And those are how people who are not from elite family become some, somebody in the, pol in the polity. Because they struggle for it and they appoint them. But they elite themselves, they pick their children, they associate their friends, this and that, and they bring them up. Yes.
That's well, how it is. Well, well, well let's uh, talk about favoritism mm. in a system like that because uh, it appears as if if you have people of the same climb mm. or the same family members, mm. one who is perhaps being tried in court mm. or is supposed to face the, the full wrath of the law, and mm. then you have uh, maybe a member of the judiciary, mm. probably a judge mm. related to the person, mm. how do we ensure that the judiciary or that particular judge mm. upholds uh, the rule of law and doesn't tilt towards the side of favoritism mm. just because this is their person? Because their family member is involved in that case. It, the, in the entire scope of independence, exactly. in the entire scope of independence mm. as a pre that the president is talking about, mm. is this also included? It will be very difficult because the independent will not be there. Because what we expect is that if the family member is in that particular issue is involved, they must not. The, that family member who is a judge or a member of the bar or a member of the bench must not be involved in the case. That's one. Then two, you know how it works in Nigeria. Technicality will always make way. Even yes. when that person is expected to be sent to jail or committed to life imprisonment, or committed to death penalty. The technicality of the law will always save them. And that's why that room for technicality comes in, in our judiciary system. Although it's not that it's bad, per se, but it's just that it has not been used in a way that it should be used to better and ensure the judiciary benefit everybody. Because the judiciary, as you see, is supposed to benefit everybody, either rich or poor. But as you speak right now, it doesn't benefit. And with the case that you have illustrated, I don't think that will happen. That independence will never be there. Rather, there will be influences here and there. Or may, there may not be direct influences, but the, what they will do is to subvert and use it a part of the law that will let that person to escape. Except maybe the people in power are not favorable to the person in question. That could be another different case. Now, now there's something else I want you to react to, mm. Adefo uh, I When I read it out earlier, mm. you sort of smiled because mm. as funny <laughs> as it seems, <laughs> It's actually not something that we should be discussing mm. or should be a topic of discussion in the country generally mm. as it stands, especially with how volatile Nigeria exactly. is. Now, on the front page of the Daily Times in uh, uh, Daily Times newspaper, on the rider, mm. the strap line on the rider says, 64th independence, Niger uh, a middle belt minorities mm. demand succession from North and others. Mm. Now, this is a form of succession that mm -hmm. uh, is a little bit different from the Biafran succession that exactly. we saw in 1967 mm -hmm. uh, to 1970. Mm. This is rather a regional a succession. succession. Exactly. They are still in the mm -hmm. country, but mm -hmm. they do not want to be, to be part attached to uh, of, or of the northern uh, mm. part of the country mm. or any or even the southern part of the country. Mm. Uh, ha, ha, what are we looking at? Because this has perhaps been an age-long issue mm. that sort of was swept under the carpet. But now it's rearing, rearing its uh, ugly head up again. Hmm. It's quite complex for such people to be able to succeed in their succession. Their point. It's going to be very complex. Although it can be achieved, but not in the immediate terms. It's going to be take a long time. Then who are those people calling for that succession? What are their reasons? What are their grievances? Why are they asking for that? You know, in the Nigerian state and the Nigerian country, so the ethnic nationality, there's the integration that we have had over the years. To detach, it's going to be very difficult. But it's because of the complicity, complicity in that regard. But what we need to tell this set of people is that they should come out with their grievance. So what is the really challenge? I know it won't be far from the insecurity issue. It won't be far from the uh, ex men farmers challenges. Yes. Get it. And it could also be far from marginalization and oppression of this set of people in their own area. But they must come out with their grievance. They must let Nigeria know their grievance. And they must also let Nigeria know why they want to succeed from the other part that is close to them. Because if we don't know, if we just assume that, okay, they want to assess it because, no, it will not be better. But what we need to also let them know that it's going to be a very complex issue to solve. But we can't discourage them. Because a lot of this disconnection has happened underground, not on the surface. Particularly when it comes to economic resources in some certain area in Nigeria. That's what most Nigerians are calling for. And if you ask those people now, if there could be a reason why they want to really go because of the economic resources that they are not having access to. So we must be being part of the of the region, region, but not but they don't get access the, the dividends, dividends of being or the resources. Of you know, I like said when we started this discussion that one of the challenges we have in Nigeria, because over the years the elite deprive the poor, the masses of resource distribution evenly, and that's what is causing the grief. Yes, and that's what is causing the problem. Unless we address that aspect, when we address that aspect, then. 
the, the frustration, the aggression will die down. The dissociation that this set of people are calling for will also go down. Well, well uh, therefore, Lauren, in closing now, uh, we just have about a minute to mm. wrap up this discussion. Mm. What is your Independence Day message mm. to Nigerians as a whole? Mm. From the elite class that you have hugely criticized exactly. here on the, set, that, that's it. to the lower class that you are sympathetic with. For me, the, the elite should stop weaponizing poverty in Nigeria. I want to ask, how did they weaponize poverty? They weaponized poverty through the acceptance and implementation of new liberal economic policy, which give credence to free market economy by accepting all manner of free market policy that deprive government commanding and controlling the economy. Government must take part in businesses because that alone will help Nigerians to enjoy the benefit of resource distribution that we're talking about. We could quickly mention the issue of a uh, first subsidy. If government have taken a drastic action by building a refinery and making refinery to work, most Nigerians will not be complaining about social removal or social no removal. Then the floating of the Naira exchange rate is also a challenge. We knew why government is going after floating of the Naira because they are looking for money to save and to defend the uh, Naira currency. But they also need to know that Nigerians are suffering as a result of over dependence on importation, which means that government must concentrate on how Nigerians can be productive and that will alone will help us to aggravate and to reduce some of our suffering. And for the poor Nigerians, for ordinary Nigerians like myself, we just need to show patriotism to our country and be law abiding. Protests should come, but should be come within the limit of laws. Not protest to riot, but protest to receive our freedom from the elite. Wow, <laughs> well, there, there isn't a better way to put it <laughs> exactly. than uh, this uh, very powerful message to uh, Nigerians as a whole. But I must thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Defolarin Olamilekon, for always, mm. always finding the time to come around and share your deep wealth of knowledge with us on the program. Thanks for always having me. And thank you for the management of AGBN for giving the likes of all the opportunity, economic analysts, political analysts, to always share our light and wisdom so that we can better our country. That in six years' time that we'll be celebrating our 70 years anniversary of Nigerian independence, we'll not be complaining about frustration and despair. We'll not be complaining about lack of food or high cost of food. We'll be talking about abundance and even the distribution of wealth across Nigeria. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for well, that me. has been uh, Mr. Defolarin Olamilekon, who is an economic and political analyst in the studio. And it has been a very, very robust discussion on our newspaper uh, review headline segment. Now, uh, this will continue after the break, where we will be taking a look at Nigeria's 64th Independence Day anniversary, reflecting on the past and connecting the future. Do well to stay with us. When we come back, Morning Express continues. <laughs>